everyone this is ross ratty and welcome to another episode of fruit talk this is the podcast style video that i do for you guys every wednesday night at nine o'clock eastern we talk a lot about fruits and a lot about vegetables and you know how to use that stuff in the kitchen as well as um you know how to grow it and the really rare and interesting things uh fruits that you probably have never heard of you didn't know you could grow um that's what this podcast is all about so let's get started in today's episode we're going to be talking a lot about bed prep and preparing a bed of soil for vegetables annual production as well as um you know just some figs some fig trees that i found actually in the area and it really has shed some light on some data in terms of hardiness and just how hardy a lot of these varieties are um, so i want to talk to you guys about that um, but before i do i want to make a quick announcement our website has changed we're making a lot of changes now to the website. A lot of things are going to be happening on the YouTube channel, on the website. Uh, we're really making things um, more user friendly. Also, we're trying to direct a lot of the traffic to our website because eventually we want to get ranked on Google. Um, that's the goal. I did some consulting work very recently for those of you guys who are interested, by the way. Um, you can go to the website and click on the consulting page and that will take you right to um, you know a way of contacting me although this is going to be gone very soon um, in fact it was moved to patreon but I think we're actually going to take it off patreon and move it to a different um, service either upwork or Fiverr or there's another one that uh, you can have consulting work and offer that on there and then that way people can can rate me and um, it may actually attract new people um, outside of my YouTube channel, outside of the podcast into wanting to do some consulting work. Um, so I did some consulting work with uh, John, shout out to John, and he taught me a few things about SEO and I've realized that he's right and I'm just not really making use of my content, not really making use of... Um, all the hard work that I've been putting in it's really it could be a lot better in terms of what I'm kind of getting out of it in terms of income um, you know the blog could certainly be something in the future that really is informative and ranks on Google for a number of fig related topics that could eventually drive a lot of traffic to the website and then therefore drive a lot of traffic to the consulting page, to my videos, to the plants I have for sale, to even the podcast. So it all really helps itself out. That's kind of, you know, also another big reason why we do the, the podcast. You know, this, all this stuff kind of loops in together. Um, so that's a big goal of mine. And I ended up taking the step and buying a domain name. Um, I ended up getting having to upgrade the service as well on Wix and now we are figboss.com and I think it's pretty uh, a pretty cool name because uh, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense right off the bat but you know a lot of people call me Ross the boss you know that's always been a nickname since I was a kid um, so now I'm kind of Ross the fig boss and that's sort of <laughs> not really how I'm gonna refer to myself maybe maybe I will maybe I won't I'm not sure but the point is, um, on the YouTube channel, if you go to our YouTube channel, it's just Ross Ratty. You know, that's the name of the channel, and I don't really know if that's ideal. I think, um, yeah, having your name and having a brand around your name is nice, but uh, especially on Google, it could certainly attract more people if, you know, it's not someone's random name. Like, who the hell is going to know who Ross Ratty is if they're trying to find some information out on figs? So, um, I think if we made our website more fig related, it could drive a lot of traffic to it, offer a lot of information to people, and then again, you know, drive a lot of traffic to other areas of what I do. Um, so, that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be focusing a lot on SEO and getting the blog up and running way more than it kind of has and trying to get a lot of this working I, I'm gonna design a logo um, I have a couple ideas we still have some things that are kind of in the works with the podcast too because it's still not really on 
any of the hosting websites. So we are going to put that on there as soon as humanly possible. I need to get some artwork finished. That's really the only thing that's holding me back is artwork. And I've been saying that for a while, but we are going to develop some artwork, whether it's a logo, banners, you know, thumbnails, you name it. It's all going to change. And then we're going to actually have some merch revolving around those logos and those different things. Um, you know, for myself, at least I'm going to get myself some hats, maybe some t-shirts. Uh, I love to wear hats, as many of you guys know, um, especially now that my hair is much longer. But uh, we're going to be we're going to be uh, having myself some hats with my own logo on it. So that's pretty cool. I'm excited for it. Um, I've got some really good ideas for how this is all going to kind of tie together with the Fig Boss name and, you know, what it's all going to look like. So... Uh, I'm excited, but on to the episode now. I want to show you guys a couple of fig trees that I found here in the area, in the Philadelphia area. We went over just randomly. Um, I was walking to meet someone for a date and different part of the city I've never been in. And um, I found this fig tree, just huge, probably like 20 feet tall. Um, at the highest point here, very minimal dieback. Um, it's certainly in 7B, and that's the biggest difference, I think, between my yard and and the city is that I'm not exactly in the city. I'm in the suburbs of the city, and the city itself has a crazy microclimate because there's so much concrete. Um, they're also very close to the Delaware. It's just a huge mecca of heat is kind of what I like to uh, to say and so they're not in 7a like I am they're in 7b and also <clears throat> those really cold temperatures during the winter time are just much more mild or not mild but also you know they are mild but also more importantly is not as um, long you know I think that's the biggest difference when you're near a, a giant body of water or you're in a really nice microclimate the temperatures are more gradual they're not as extreme and they're not as as long as they would be if you're out in the open somewhere in the suburbs you know um so i think that's where i really struggle and i also found some trees that are also in 7b um i found i was with my buddy dom shout out to dom we were in um the jersey shore and you can see this is a tree that we found a blue celeste or Probably some sort of Celeste. I don't know if it's blue or not. I don't know why I keep saying blue, but I imagine it's a blue Celeste. And yeah, okay, by the leaves, that's why I think it's blue Celeste. But um, it's a huge tree. I mean, this was one of three that I found, but this one seemed to be the oldest on the island uh, at the shores. That this one probably is about 20, 15, 20 years old. That trunk is huge. It's loaded with figs, guys. It is massive, so um, you know, really impressive how just some of these trees can get to this size and that productive just a small distance away from where I live. You know, it's kind of nuts. I mean, like we're pretty much, and I've said this a lot, but we're really, we realistically are on the edge of surviving and death every single year, every winter. So. It's kind of disappointing, but also brings a lot of hope because then you know that, you know, if you're right on the edge, all you need is a good year. All you need is a really strong variety and you can make it work. You know, I think there's definitely, um, and I've seen trees in the area. It's not like I've never seen any trees. I've seen some in, you know, Northeast Philly. I've seen some in Princeton. Um, I've seen some um, also out you know, towards like uh, the Montgomery County area of Pennsylvania. I've seen some in Bucks County. You know, I've seen them actually all over the area. And some of them can be quite large. But without a doubt, you know, it really is so much easier to grow figs in the city in a 7B climate. That's pretty much it. If you live somewhere that's 7B, I, then that's, I think, what's really happening here is that Maybe five degrees is really the cutoff for a lot of these varieties, but also more specifically, 
the duration of that temperature. And I think that's the biggest key here is that, yeah, maybe we get down to zero degrees every year, but how long is that happening for? If that was maybe just very a very short amount of time, maybe an hour or two hours, I think we'd be okay. But, you know, and then also the gradual Diff, the gradual change in temperature if it's you know really all of a sudden you're at like you know 10 degrees and you go all the way down to zero in like a matter of a half an hour or, or an hour or something like that is that even possible i don't know but the point is um you know it, it definitely wouldn't would make a lot of sense if we have a lot of colder days and then have a really extreme cold day i think our trees would do a lot better whereas if we had a bunch of warm days and then a really cold day I think that is way worse than something that's consistently cold so you know who knows but like I said it's giving me a lot of disappointment but also hope for the future here on my property and, and to be honest with you I'm not really even doing too much of this anymore I think I've pretty much made up my mind in another episode that we did we talked about covering them with tarps and how I'm training them in the ground and how I'm planting them and really just getting them cut back to the base and then covering them I think is honestly my best bet. So we will see. But uh, I also want to mention before I move on to bed prep is that we did just make ourselves a peach pie. And we've been getting peaches galore, man. I have, if I show you guys this photo here, this is two baskets worth. Of uh, really nice peaches, good size, good color, amazing flavor. Some of these are picked a bit too early, and it's a bit of a shame that some of the ones that I picked a bit earlier in the trees um, in the picking process, I picked some of them a little too early. But uh, we are going to dry a lot of them. Again, we're making peach pie. I have roughly already harvested about this basket size here on the right I've probably already harvested about eight of those and there's still probably about another four baskets worth or another three baskets worth on the tree so I would say you know I don't think it was an exaggeration that I have about 300 peaches this year it really is um, kind of nuts it's just insane um, we have so many peaches I've been giving away as many as I could but you know I don't really know what to do with them uh, we're gonna dry. I'm gonna see if I can dry about 50 and See if I can stick as many of them in the oven as possible and get them You know somewhere around probably somewhere below 150 degrees You know probably like six hours or so maybe even longer probably longer to be honest with you and just uh, and dry them um, and then we can actually take the pit out at a later point you know we don't have to really uh, pit them or anything I think we could just dry them whole and then go from there you know I think that's a good way of preserving them and keeping them fresh or at least uh, eat you know edible and still good for the winter time um, <clears throat> so that's that and then the next thing I want to talk to you guys about bed prep and this is something that's kind of been like an epiphany to me and I don't really have a nice little photo for those of you guys who are watching Maybe I can go to my YouTube channel real quick and show you guys what I mean here. Um, in our potato video hey everyone. that we did actually yesterday, if you guys are watching, this is the new bed that we created. Um, and the bed here is, I would say, not the best in terms of preparation. I think I'd rather have more soil, uh, more inches of soil, uh, inches of compost. But um, for the most part, it's pretty damn well prepared. And this is going to really set me up. And this is a huge, like, we talk a lot about this. I mean, I try to talk about this, but I haven't really realized. It's like another year or another season almost of vegetables or annuals that have gone by. And I've realized how big of a difference it is from growing fruit trees. It just really is all about the soil. And if you don't have great bed prep from the beginning you're just not going to succeed and if you do it's not going to be nearly as well as somebody else and um you know i've learned some things so let's kind of go into the things i've learned about here you know what let's talk about how to prepare a bed really quickly let's do that 
So you could take any soil. I don't care what it is. If you just throw down, you know, four to six inches of well-aged compost, we're talking about compost that has very few large pieces in it. It's really well broken down. It's black. It's nutritious. It holds lots of water. You know, that is really going to create yourself the start that you want. First off, with that awesome soil, you can really easily direct seed into that. Um, it also has the right nutrition level. It holds water well. So, um, you know, those are pretty much the most important things here is that you need to have the right nutrition. You know, you need to have the right amount of water. Um, and of course, positioning the bed is going to be equally important for the amount of sun, right? That's what we think about when we're, we're growing plants is like they need food, water, and sun. I mean, those are the three main things. Um, we'll get into positioning in just a second, but you know, I think this is honestly the best way to do it. And I've seen a lot of market gardeners. I watch a lot of market gardeners, guys. Um, people like uh, Charles Dowding. Um, I've seen some of JM's videos. I've seen some of Curtis Stone's videos. I've seen this guy right here, this crazy guy. Um, <laughs> what's this guy's name? Uh, let's see. Let's go to the video here. This crazy guy. Uh, let's see. It doesn't say for some reason. But anyway, he is essentially also a market gardener that goes from Florida up to Maine and goes back and forth. And basically, you know, between the bunch of them, they really are an inspiration in terms of how to grow vegetables. I mean, if you want to learn how to grow vegetables, I would say those are like the best people to do it from. Um, so from them, I've, you know, this is pretty much how a lot of them do it is that they get themselves. I mean, at least Charles Darting, Doubting does this probably the most, at least the most intensively as he calls it, no dig. And he just essentially puts down compost every single year um, that's broken down well. In fact, he goes to crazy lengths to get the right compost, to put down compost that's, you know, if it's not well broken down, he'll let it sit there for a year, two years. And then he'll put it on his beds. Um, you know, he really does go through crazy lengths to get the right soil because he realizes how important that is to healthy and productive vegetables. I mean, or annuals, you should I should say. So that's key number one. It, it also helps with, with weeding too. I mean, it's easier to weed. Um, you also have less weeds. Um, you don't have to disturb the soil. You know, I think no dig is realistically the best way. And I, it's crazy to think that one way is the best way because I don't like to say that this is the exact best way or the ultimate way of doing one particular thing and growing because there's so many ways to do the same thing. That I don't like to really say that, but uh, I honestly believe that this is probably the best way. I mean, just not disturbing the soil and adding compost and amendments on every year is going to net you really realistically i'm telling you it's going to you're going to have the best results um you could do this whole thing in a raised bed too but you know with the right soil but for me i'd rather just have a raised bed just that's connected to the native ground you know i want to have that native soil improve over time I want to have worms in my soil um, that also then improves the soil underneath. I want to also make use of the soil underneath because it holds a lot of water. It's super clay. You know, it's got lots of nutrition, probably other sources of nutrition that my compost may not have or my amendments maybe I missed. So, you know, I think it's also important to use that native soil. And then there's other things in the native soil that you may not find in a raised bed like you know, mycorrhizae, you probably could, but, and you can inoculate that, you know, in your raised beds, but, um, you know, maybe it's just not as in high abundance. I just think that um, it's an easy way. It makes a whole lot of sense. It's just less work. It's less work and it, it nets you the best results. You know, um, th doing it this way here, connecting to my native soil so that the roots of these plants get in the native soil, by the way, is that they also means that I don't have to water them. You know, the compost in a lot of your yards may not be enough. You may still have to water things. 
You should. I, I should in my climate still water certain vegetables, certain annuals like my lettuces and my brassicas, things that like cooler environments, cool down the soil a bit, cool down the leaves a bit too, and that will get me, you know, better yields as well. But we're, I mean, we're not market gardeners here. Okay. The only thing I've realized, like I said, is that this is the optimal way of doing it. It just makes a whole lot of sense, and I've noticed it between the differences between my beds is that. I had one bed where we put down compost, new bed, and it just seems like a lot of new beds take some time to really get going. And maybe the first year they're not as productive, but I think that has a lot to do with the bed prep. And that's another thing is that going back to just not just putting down compost, but also making sure that compost is really moist. Um, it's well broken down, like we said. But then also, you know, it's not like it's just thrown there and then that's it you got to really spread it out make sure it's you know almost compacted I mean you can't really compact this stuff I mean I've stepped on it smushed it I mean people have you know things to actually really get the soil perfect so it's on a nice level field and that's what these market gardeners do is that they weed the whole thing they flame weed it or they tarp it after they put the compost down or they can put the compost down on top of that and then they come in there with like a BCS or something and they come in here and they smooth it all out and make it all nice and even. So then when they come in here with the cedar, their, their, um, their rose cedars, it just really is a breeze, you know? And it's not, they don't necessarily, you know, you don't necessarily have to do that, but I find that just direct seeding and growing things into level just even compost makes it just a lot easier I mean it really does it just makes a whole lot more sense not having those little you know ups and downs in your soil or little spots or here and there I think it just makes a little bit more sense to come in here take you know kind of break up the bigger clumps you know get everything nice and um, uniform and and you just have to have a lot easier of a time that way so that was one big reason I think was that one of my beds didn't have really the best broken down compost. Um, it wasn't that it wasn't you know really uh, sunken in or anything like it, it wasn't um, level or anything like that. It just didn't have the greatest soil um, because yeah it is great soil the soil that I'm using but it comes in varying various degrees right. Some of it's broken down more than others and you just have to kind of deal with that. You have to kind of realize, all right, well, you know, uh, this is just something I'm going to have to wait on. And it's unfortunate, but I would I would recommend if this is an issue with you, go and get some soil and just have it. Just hold on to it. It'll break down in the bag. You know, it'll break down over time. Um, or if you guys get it delivered, just let it sit there. Um, so that's kind of bed prep right there, right? That's kind of the, most of the, the steps. I'm sure there's maybe some other things that – little intricate details but that's kind of it you know I mean you want to just throw down that compost not disturb the soil underneath um, you know really get it tamped down pretty well and then really the biggest thing after this point is the selection of the bed because it's not just enough I think to have a, a great bed and have a great bed prep but having it in the right spot is making a huge difference so for me this little location here with where this meshes and even this bed here it doesn't actually get full sun and if I continue on in the video here maybe you guys can see it um, yeah so this is kinda it right here is that the bed although they're not in full sun is that they really get warmed up at different times of the year better than other locations in my yard so because this is on the right side of the yard and that the west sun and the southern sun really hits these areas really well in the spring, in the early spring, so like March and April, before our frost, our last frost even happens, you know, our last frost May 1st, but two months before that, the soil is being warmed up in these locations way better than any other location in my yard for the most part because there's no leaves on the trees you know there's giant shade trees I have in the backyard that really shade things out so it's important to think about where the Sun is at different times of the year so right now 
this bed actually is warm because it's warm outside, right? It's July. However, you know, it's actually getting hit by a lot of that western sun. So it's almost not the greatest place to be growing, if you think about it right now, our fall vegetables or our spring vegetables because those are the vegetables that like the cooler weather. But because it's not in full sun, that really helps out, I think, our brassicas and our different things that are going to be planted here or are planted here for the fall. When temperatures are much cooler, things days are shorter, you know, but still the leaves are going to fall off these trees sometime in November. And now this bed's suddenly going to get a lot more light, especially when it needs it the most, because then at that point when the leaves have fallen off the trees, the light's coming in and the soil is going to be warmed up even more. So, you know, at that point it's freezing. And this is really just, I think, the most optimal position for either a, a spring bed or a fall bed. And that's kind of how I'm just doing this. You know, not everybody has access to just completely open ground with, you know, 100% um, full sun all day, every day. You know, uh, we really got to get creative and think about where we want these things. And I think in inevitably this actually helps, you know, get a better start to the season than some of the other beds I have, which are would most likely be in full sun, but they don't really get as much of that western sun that this bed or this location does. So again, um, I think locations all are just super, super important. The other bed that I have, which has done really poorly. I have a couple beds. I have one on the west side that really doesn't have the greatest soil, but we just stuck some plants in there. They're doing incredible because we have that western sun. It's really hot. Everything got warmed up super quick there. Whereas I have other plants on the north side of my house, which don't get a whole lot of sun, maybe some morning sun, a little bit of sun in the afternoon on onwards. But because they don't really get a whole lot of sun, and the soil isn't warmed up quick enough, it just doesn't work out. Nothing really grew too well there. And for me, it just doesn't seem like the greatest place to grow certain vegetables. And in fact, most vegetables. In fact, if I had the choice, I probably, like I said, I probably would just grow all these vegetables in full sun all day. And that would be that, you know? And I would have really warm soil at the right time of the year be able to direct seed, be able to transplant, be able to do this, do that. You know, it really is all about location and placement. So I wanted to just do this video for you guys and kind of explain this little epiphany that's just happened to me, comparing some of my beds to some other beds and how unproductive some of them were and just really the biggest difference in like almost not even nutrition, but really just how warm the soil was. You know, I think that's just so, so important. You know, the one bed that was on the west side of the house that doesn't have good soil, I transplanted things in there and they did well. But if I were to direct seed into that, forget about it. It's just not going to happen. You know, you need to have that compost to really be able to direct seed that right level of moisture, that right um, amount of surface area to get that, that germination. Um, so yeah, thank you guys for watching this episode of Fruit Talk. Again, check out the website, figboss.com. You can guys can also come down here at the bottom and subscribe to the newsletter, and this will let you know when we have a new post. Also, if we do a live stream episode like we do sometimes, this will definitely let you know because I do make um, posts on the blog letting you guys know when we're live for any episodes of Fruit Talk. So again, thank you guys so much for watching this one, and we will talk to you all next week. Take care, everyone.